So we'll start off then by looking at water waves. Here I've got water waves which are incident on a barrier and there are two gaps in the barrier. And what happens is that we get diffraction of the water waves from each of those two gaps in the barrier. And these two diffraction patterns of the water waves end up interfering with each other and we end up with a very characteristic interference pattern shown on the right hand side here. So I've approximated that here by showing regions of constructive interference where peaks have coincided and then also regions of destructive interference where a peak and trough coincide and we end up with no net wave at that particular position. Now if we consider light, for example laser light incident on a screen now with two slits, yet again we get the very characteristic diffraction patterns from those two slits and we also then as a result have interference of those two diffraction patterns resulting in this interference pattern on the right hand side and again we see the very distinctive features here of constructive and destructive interference of the light waves. Now what happens if we consider particles? Well classically if we aimed a number of particles at a barrier here, a screen with two slits, then we might expect, for example, two clusters of particles being detected on the right-hand side of that barrier. Now let's see what happens, though, if we fire electrons at a screen with two slits. What is observed is very remarkable. What we actually see is, in fact, this characteristic interference pattern which takes us right back to what we've been looking at for the case of light waves and even water waves where we observe that there are these bands of reinforcement in other words constructive interference and then also these regions where there are effectively no detections so regions of destructive interference and so we see here therefore that these electrons going through two slits are resulting in an interference pattern, even though we still are detecting discrete positions of those electrons. So we might think, well, OK, it's the electrons collectively behaving like waves. But let's take a closer look. What if we put the electrons through one at a time? First of all, though, let's take a look at this situation here, this schematic, uh, where I've got now an electron beam gun firing electrons at a double slit and showing us that interference pattern that we've just been observing. Now what happens, to try and understand more clearly, what happens if we put those electrons through just one at a time? So here then, if we fire one electron through the double slit, we end up with a single detection of that electron. If we do another electron, we get another detection, another one, another one, if we keep putting electrons through this double slit one at a time, we get these detections on the screen. As we let them build up over time, then what we observe as we keep on putting electrons through the double slits one at a time is that we still end up with this distinctive interference pattern, which means that each and every individual electron is behaving like a wave. It's not the fact of having many electrons that gives rise to the interference pattern, but even electrons just one at a time are behaving like waves. So this is a simulation now of an electron as a wave packet now aiming towards a double slit in a screen. Let's see what happens. This is now a single wave function which is the electron and we see part of the wave function interfering on the right there and we also see part of the wave function uh, being reflected. So this is still one single wave function which is one single electron but we see that in fact it is in many position states simultaneously. In other words the electron could be found in any of those positions. So in fact it was Louis de Broglie who way back in 1924 postulated, even before any experimental evidence, that electrons, or particles in general, behave like waves. Just as light behaves like waves in some situations, light can also behave as particles in other situations, just like that also 
he postulated that particles have this, if you like, wave-particle duality. And so he put forward this very simple equation that the wavelength of a particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum, the mass times velocity, of the particle. And remarkably then, um, after this postulate of wave-particle duality for electrons, for particles, Remarkably, later on in 1927, Sir George Paget Thompson, son of the famous J.J. Thompson who discovered the electron, 1927, Sir George Paget Thompson demonstrated electron diffraction, as did also Davison, as in the Davison and Germer experiment. And as a result, in 1937, Thompson and Davison shared the Nobel Prize for their demonstration of the wave behavior of electrons. Let's quickly check Louis de Broglie's expression here in a very crude way. We can take the famous E equals mc squared expression from Einstein, and also we could take the energy is equal to hf expression for the energy of a photon. Very crudely, we could take that energy hf, put it on the left-hand side here, and have hf is equal to mc squared. This is really just a test of dimensionality, so a very crude check here. And then if we use uh, velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, then we can substitute for frequency over here by using c over lambda. So therefore, h c over lambda is equal to mc squared. Then we could take the fact, well, mass times velocity is basically momentum, which we're writing as p. So rather crudely, we could break down mc squared and say that that's mcc, and then take the mc as a momentum p. So therefore we get hc over lambda is equal to p times c, and therefore we end up with h over lambda, which is equal to momentum, and therefore we obtain Louis de Broglie's expression. So just a very crude check of why, at least from a dimensional perspective, that expression can work. So let's take a look at uh, another simulation of a wave packet of an electron aiming for a double slit. What we observe then, this wave function, in fact, diffracts through those two slits. Part of the wave function is reflected, and part of the wave function uh, results in an interference pattern on the right-hand side. So this is a wave packet representing, um, this is basically a wave function for an electron. And what happens is this uh, diffraction and resulting interference pattern on the right-hand side. And what we're saying then is that we could observe the electron on the right-hand side here, and we're saying we get an interference pattern very reminiscent to what we're seeing with this depiction here. And then what happens at detection is that only one single location for the electron is found, and so therefore this wave function on the right-hand side here is found to be proportional to, or rather, should I say, related to, the probability of finding the electron at any given particular position. So therefore, if we consider this um, instead as a probability distribution, then at measurement, what happens is that the wave function collapses to just one single detection point. So what we're seeing here with these black dots is representation of measurement of one single electron position. So this would correspond to detection of many electrons that have passed through this double slit. But remember, the wave function that we've just been seeing represents just one single electron. The wave function is the electron, and the wave function is telling us, basically giving us the probability of finding the electron at any given particular position x. Okay, so here are various snapshots through that simulation of the wave function. So as then we've been seeing, this is another schematic of that situation where we've got electrons aiming for this double slit um, screen here, and then we're detecting an interference pattern on the right-hand side, and noticing though that it's one electron at a time that is building up that interference pattern. We don't detect the entirety of the wave function, but rather just one particular position. And that's why we refer to what's known as wave function collapse the wave function collapses to just one single particular detected position, rather than being detected as an entire waveform. So also to point out what happens with wave function collapse is that it is associated with measurement. 
And so we see here then that if we were to try and observe to see which slit the electron passed through, if we make an observation of where the electron is, then we collapse the wave function to a very definite position when we observe it. So therefore, if we made the observation just next to each of those slits, therefore we'd no longer get an interference pattern on the right-hand side because we've collapsed the wave function and forced it into one particular position state when we made the observation. So let's try and understand this a bit better by considering a cross-section, a profile through that wave function. So now I'm saying that a, a profile through that wave function we can regard as this function psi of x. This is freezing a moment in time and looking at the value of the wave function. What we're saying is that each ind individual electron has had to pass through both slits in order to give a wave pattern on the right hand side which when collapsed still gives us as it builds up from the many electrons still gives us an interference pattern. So therefore the electron must have gone through both slits and so therefore the electron must be in many possible positions as it goes through that double slit experiment. And as we're saying then that psi of x relates to the probability of finding the electron at any given particular position x. So let's see what we mean by that. We're basically saying that psi of x is a superposition of all the possible position states. And what, what I mean by a position state is I'm going to use this delta function to depict all the possible positions. So I'm building up that uh, arbitrary wave function there. I'm building it up by adding together all of these delta functions, these position states, all of them individually shifted to every single possible location that I might consider. So we're saying that this wave function, in other words, this profile here through that 2D wave function that we saw before, frozen in time, that wave function is equal to a superposition, an integral over position states delta x. And of course, each of the positions is denoted by positioning those delta functions at all the possible positions x prime. So x prime there depicts a particular choice of position along that position x axis. Um, so x prime indicates the position and therefore delta x minus x prime is just one of those particular arrow functions. And we're saying that the wave function is the superposition of all of those position states where each position state is simply weighted by the wave function evaluated at the particular position x prime. So we'll take another look at that in this slide here. We're saying that the wave function, the electron, is in fact in many possible position states simultaneously. It is in many positions simultaneously. And we're saying that the wave function psi of x relates to the probability of finding the particle, finding the electron at any given particular position x. And in fact, the probability is equal to psi star psi. And um, to take a look at that wave function, we're going to freeze it in time there. And again, we're saying that this wave function, psi of x, is equal to the summation of all these possible position states where the probability of finding it in any particular, finding the electron in any particular position is actually rated to psi star psi. And when we make a measurement, we're basically sampling from that probability density function. In other words, we're sampling from psi star psi, and we're sampling from that probability distribution to find just one particular position when we measure, when we observe the location of the electron. And that is what is known as wave function collapse, when instead of having the superposition of all of those many possible states, the wave function collapses to just one definite particular position. And that's why I'm observing on the right hand side here, no longer this distributed wave function with many possible positions, but instead now just one particular position x prime. And so I just want to finish then by in fact explicitly showing again the wave function is an amplitude which when we look at the square of that, that's psi star psi, which gives us the probability density function, the probability of finding 
the electron, or in general a particle, any particular position x. And so here I'm showing a time varying wave function. Position x is along here, and we're seeing the time varying probability of finding the particle either side of this particular barrier. Hope that's been useful. Thank you very much for listening.